The term advice and consent appears in the part of the Constitution that makes the president the nation's chief diplomat. Article 2, Section 2, Paragraph 2. It provides that the president has authority to make treaties by seeking the Senate's advice, and those treaties become binding if approved by two-thirds of the Senate. Since the 1790s, the Senate has approved more than 1,500 treaties and rejected only 20. Americans tend to take advice and consent for granted, but it has been the source of debate throughout our history. While the founders were suspicious of executive power in general, they largely agreed that a strong executive was needed to advance the international interests of the new nation. Their belief that George Washington would be the first president helped the founders agree that the president should take the initiative in negotiating treaties subject to the Senate's approval. Washington did not need to wait long to try out his constitutional power as chief diplomat. When Britain and France went to war in 1793, he issued a neutrality proclamation because he knew it would be in America's best interest not to be drawn into this foreign conflict. He made this sweeping announcement without consulting the Senate. Yet the Senate did not try to block Washington's proclamation. Tension between executive and legislative branches regarding foreign affairs has continued ever since. By 1794, Washington realized that the United States needed a new treaty with Great Britain. The British had failed to live up to some of their commitments from the end of the American Revolution. Washington sent John Jay to England to negotiate a treaty that would better protect America's interests. While the British agreed to some of the American demands, they refused to address America's biggest concerns regarding trading rights in the Caribbean. Believing this treaty was the best they could hope for from Great Britain at the time, the Senate voted to ratify it. When the treaty's terms were made public, protests broke out all over the country. The uproar lasted for six weeks, the time between the treaty's publication and Washington's signing of it. The protests then quickly faded. Americans thought very highly of their first president. The most famous instance of Senate rejection of a treaty took place after World War I. President Woodrow Wilson's handling of the 14 points and Treaty of Versailles met with fierce opposition in the Senate. President Wilson's foe, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Lodge and others were deeply opposed to the U.S. joining the League of Nations as provided in the treaty. They saw membership in such an international organization as a threat to American sovereignty. Wilson did not seek or accept the Senate's advice on the treaty. He refused to consider Lodge's reservations. The Treaty of Versailles was rejected in three different votes of the Senate, marking the first time in U.S. history that the Senate rejected a peace treaty. Perhaps learning from history, President Jimmy Carter took a different approach to win Senate approval of an unpopular treaty. By the 1960s, many people in Latin America objected to what they saw as American imperialism in the region. The main symbol of that imperialism was the Panama Canal, which had been built by the United States in the early 1900s. Carter believed it would be better to cooperate with a friendly Panama government than for the canal to become what he called an American garrison amid hostile surroundings. He began negotiations in 1977 toward two new treaties to gradually turn the canal over to Panama. Opinion ran strongly against the new agreements, both in the Senate and in the United States as a whole. Carter embarked on a massive campaign to explain the benefits of the treaties to the public. He sent a task force across the country to make more than 1,500 appearances. He also exercised a very personal role in persuading senators to lend their support. Throughout the Senate debate, Carter personally tracked the progress of the treaties, talking daily with senators, answering questions, and agreeing to various Senate modifications. Though both negative public opinion and Senate objection originally stood in his way, Jimmy Carter was able to achieve the two-thirds majority necessary for Senate ratification of the Panama Canal Treaties of 1977. As these events show, a president is wise to exercise his role as chief diplomat carefully, 
balancing competing interests in a manner that faithfully executes the powers vested in him under Article 2.